well, hey, how are you this fine day? Well, things are looking beautiful here in Florida. Um, it is the 1st of January, and I hope you had a wonderful 2022. Here we are in 2023, and it's looking good so far. What's gonna happen over the next six weeks is that we put together the top programs that you, you, the viewer, have chosen as being the top programs of the Chapel Hour. And let me tell you, it's gonna be great. These were some fantastic programs and everybody loved them and they got a lot of activity and we just believe that they're worthy of seeing a second time. So these are previously recorded programs that you're about to see for the next six weeks, but they're not just any previously recorded programs, they're the best of 2022 of the Chapel Hour. Um, right after these six, I want to I want to just give you a little bit of a teaser because right after this, we're going to see uh, an update from Jim and Becky Leach from Romania. That's fantastic. You are you will not want to miss that. Uh, then right after that, we've got a two-hour program where Ruth, Rebecca, Rachel, and I stood around the piano and just sang every song that we knew and all the memories that we had. And a lot of you are a part of that program because we talked about you. Ooh, yep, you're gonna to wanna to not miss that program. And then at the very end, right before we start up with the Weissart Family Singers in the Chapel Hour again for 2023, we're gonna show the bloopers of the Weissart Family Singers in the Chapel Hour. You won't wanna miss that either. It's gonna be, it's gonna be, you're gonna get a good laugh out of that, I promise. But for now, just sit back and enjoy for the next six weeks the best of the best, the cream of the crop of the Chapel Hour and the Weisner Family Singers. I think you're going to enjoy this. Welcome once again to all of our Wise Heart Family Singers, Chapel Hour, friends and family, wherever you are. I need to share just a little bit of a side uh, and aside for you before I start in. A few weeks ago, I preached a message on John 17, and uh, it was on Christ's high priestly prayer, and I told you uh, in there, Jesus prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for you. If you'll remember, I, I said that Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for his disciples, then he, he said, I pray for all of those people that will believe on me through uh, what my disciples say. And you and I, we have read our Bible, and we've read what uh, the disciples said and what Jesus said, and we've believed on the Lord through that. What I wanted to uh, just remind you of today is he's still praying for you. Not just he prayed for you, but he is still praying for you. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, and Romans chapter 8, verses 27 and 34, say that Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for me. That's a good thought to start with.
Soul Job. Today marks our fifth in the series, Nothing is Too Hard for God. And the subject today is Fear Not. That may be a message that some of you need today. You may be fearful. I trust that something that some scripture we read or something we say will be helpful to you today. So I'm going to start by reading some scriptures that uh, will relate to our subject. Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 56, verses 4 and 11, uh, In God I will praise His word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And then verse 11, In God have I put my trust, I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Psalm 111, verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. And then from the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love. There is no fear, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Hebrews Chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have because he has said, I will not leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man can do unto me. Then Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And uh, I like that, okay, but I like Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 better. Psalm 56, 3 says, What time I'm afraid, I'm afraid I will trust in thee. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. The word fear uh, and the word afraid are mentioned in the, in the Bible over 700 times. Fear uh, can have two meanings when you look at it. Uh, doesn't matter if you're looking at it in English or Hebrew or Greek. It, it, these two meanings remain the same. There's fear that is called an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by a sense of danger. Or a profound reverence and awe, especially toward God. It's reported that the newspaper columnist Ann Landers received about 10,000 letters each month from people with all kinds of problems. And all of these problems could be reduced to one common problem, 
And someone said that was the problem of fear. When people lose their faith in Christ, fear takes its place. In fact, just this week I heard a minister on television. He said uh, that fear is, he said, uh, some people say it's faith and unbelief, but he said it's not that. The opposite of fear is, of faith is fear. If you're, you don't have faith, then fear takes its place. Luke chapter 21, verse 26, he was speaking about the last days, and he said, Men's hearts would fail them for fear and for looking after those things which were coming on the earth in preparation for those last days. Our fears have many sources, and most of them are related to this uh, strong emotion caused by a sense of danger. Uh, we fear regarding the economy. Uh, somebody may lose their job. Uh, terrorism we're afraid of. Crime. Loss of health. Loss of relationships in one way or another. And don't forget Mother Nature either. There can be fear of storms, ice storms or rainstorms, snow, hail, tornadoes, hurricanes, or floods. And we've heard that just this week, this past uh, week. Uh, in, it's been in the news for a while. In Kentucky, they had too much water, floods, or it can be drought, too little water. There can be earthquakes, volcano eruptions, or forest fires. And here lately, we've heard a lot about forest fires, terrible forest fires in California. But, you know, we don't hear very much about the fear of the Lord. Yet it's this very awesome and reverent fear of God that can release us from the fears of the world that we face. It has been said that there are two kinds of fear, a normal fear and an abnormal fear. Normal fear is that which prompts us to avoid dangerous things such as unstable buildings or dangerous objects such as live wires sometimes you see laying around after a, a severe storm, or dangerous situ situations such as riots. Uh, normal fear is necessary for our protection and for the exercise of what we might call sensible caution. Abnormal fear is not like normal fear. In fact, it, the word abnormal means different from the standard or the normal. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, we find David in a situation where he may have experienced some of both kinds of this fear during the time that he was fleeing from Saul and Saul's army. The background of the situation you'll find in 1 Samuel chapters 16 to 30. And let me just kind of briefly cover those. In chapter 16, David is anointed king and he plays the harp for Saul. You might remember after he was anointed king, uh, Saul had disobeyed God. And so the Bible says the spirit departed from Saul. And he called for someone to play the harp for him. They found David and he played the harp for Saul. Then in chapter 17, we find David slaying Goliath. Chapter 18 speaks of David's victories and all the people shouting, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And that kind of aggravated Saul when he heard that cry. And so in chapter 19, we find that Saul becomes David's enemy and David has to flee from Saul. And so in cha chapters 20 to 26, David is still fleeing from Saul. And finally, in chapter 27, he gets tired of fleeing. And he goes and uh, he uh, settles down with the Philistines, which were Israel's, one of their real arch enemies, with King Achish as their leader. But when the king finds out that David is fleeing from Saul, he figures, well, he must be against Israel too. So he accepted David and gave him the city of Ziklag. I'm not sure how they did it back then, how you give somebody a city, but it says he gave him the city of 
Ziklag. In chapter 28, the, Philist the Philistines plan a battle against Israel, and Achish invites David to go with him into the battle. Well, chapter 29, the Philistine officers hear that uh, David's going to go with them. They didn't trust David quite as much as King Achish did, so uh, they rebelled a little bit, and so King Achish, Achish sent David back home. And what they experienced on their way back home, you will find in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, verses 1 to 6. This is as David and his army approached their home in Ziklag. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the, Am the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and they had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until there was no more power to weep. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But, and this is the verse I wanted you to remember, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. As we mentioned before, David may have experienced a little bit of both kinds of the fear that I mentioned. Before David and his army, there was smoke and ruin and uncertainty regarding their wives and their families. Behind David, the weeping had turned into anger, and David's army was speaking of stoning him. And the only way that David had that he could look was up. And that reminded me of a, a little story I heard one time about a little girl and her father driving along about roasting ear time. They were passing this nice field of uh, roasting ears, and the father stopped, got out of the car, went over into the field, and was just getting ready uh, to uh, get a nice ear to a car, and he looked all around to see if anybody was watching, and all of a sudden he heard his little girl's voice saying, Daddy, did you look up? I'm not sure what he did after that, but I, I hope he did look up and change his mind there. So David looked up, and the Bible states that David encouraged himself in the Lord. 1 Samuel 30, verse 8, And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this trip? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David started out, but when he and his army got to the brook Bezor, he faced another difficulty. He started out with 600 men, but when they got to the brook, 200 of David's men were so exhausted and weak they couldn't even cross the brook. And so David had to continue on with just uh, 400 men. So trusting the Lord's promise, David continued on with his 400, 400 men that were left. And I've pointed this out a number of times in past messages, but I think it would be good to mention it again here, that if we will take heed to Paul's word in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 14, we can learn some valuable lessons from the experiences that people and individuals, and, and the individuals went through in the Old Testament as they followed the Lord. Do you recall Paul's words then? were that uh, these things happened to Israel. He talked about how Israel had disobeyed the Lord and how God had to judge them and everything. And he said, these things happened to the children of Israel for our example that we should not do as they did. So let's uh, look and see what are some of the things that we can learn from this incident in David's life that would relate to this subject of fear. I can see several important things in this incident that brought David to a place of victory over any 
fears he might have had in his heart. So let's look at them one by one. David, first of all, David was conscious of his circumstances. He realized that he had compromised in seeking asylum with the Philistines. He realized that there was a disaster laying before him. He realized that there was a dangerous situation developing behind him. And how often a compromise can have disastrous consequences. We can compare this with Lot in the book of Genesis. The Bible says Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. And that ended up being a very bad decision. Later on, when they were about to take Jericho, and they took Jericho, and you remember that uh, Achan took some of the forbidden things, and his testimony later, later was, I saw, I coveted, and I took. And here are places where the awesome fear of the Lord, his promise to them, what he had told them to do, that type of fear, if it had been working, these things would never have happened. So we need men today like Poly Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, in early church history. He was threatened with death unless he would reject Christ. And his answer to those that were questioning him was, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? David did not shut his eyes to his circumstances. He did not rashly rush in, but neither did he retreat. He was very conscious of his situation. But at the same time, David was conscious of his helplessness. He was consciousness of his situation. And now he was conscious of his helplessness. He couldn't go back to the Philistines. They didn't want him. His men were so exhausted uh, that they didn't feel like crossing the brook. It had taken them three days to get there, and they were worn out. He wasn't sure if his men were for him or against him. And he may have even wondered if God was going to be with him during this time. So I'd have to ask you the question of this point. Have you ever been in a situation like this? How did you react? Did you panic? Were you afraid? Did you wonder just what you were going to do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9, Paul relates an experience that he and those that were with him went through. And he was cry, crying out at this one time for God to deliver him for, from what he called a, a thorn in the flesh. We don't know really what that was, but it was something that uh, he wanted to be delivered from. And God did not deliver him from that, but said, my grace is sufficient for thee. So that's a good thing to remember as we go through this, we may find answers for some things, but if we don't find an answer for everything, we have to remember that God's grace is sufficient for any situation, and there's nothing too hard for God. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16 say, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted just like you and me are tempted. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So David was conscious of his situation. He was conscious of his helplessness, but he was also conscious of his hope. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 and 33, when it was talking about that long list of heroes of faith, it says, And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith did one, many wonderful, wonderful works. David would recall the Psalms he had written in times as bleak as these that he was going through now when he, when he was tending his sheep. He could remember some of those times. He would remember 
he had been brought through worse trials. He had had to fight a lion and a bear, and we don't know what other problems he may have faced. He would remember that God had always been his refuge and a very present help in his time of trouble. In Psalm 42, verses 5 and 11, twice we hear David cry out, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? And then he encourages himself by saying, Hope thou in God. And that's good advice at any time in our life when we're going through problems and we're fearful or any other emotion we're going through. Hope thou in God, David said, for I shall yet praise him. When David could not encourage himself in his family or his friend or his men or his possession or anything under the sun, he remembered that there was someone above the sun that he could go to. And he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. All around was fear and uncertainty. But in God, there was peace and assurance. And I think in similar circumstances, we can go to that same source of comfort that David did. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses uh, 3 to 11, Paul describes a situation in which he and his co-workers were going, had gone through, he, he, the way he describes it, he said there was, there was absolutely, absolutely no way of escape from this situation. And it was, it was almost like the death sentence had been passed upon them, and they didn't have any way out. But then it says that Paul was inspired with a strong confidence in God, who could not only keep from death, but was also able to raise from the dead. In fact, Paul said that even if the whole situation was that we might even have to die, he's able to raise us from the dead. Just like the book of Hebrews points out that uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, believing that even if he had to sacrifice him, God could raise him up from the dead and he would still be that promised son. In fact, the deliverance that God wrought to Paul and his companions was, was so great, it was so tantamount to a resurrection from the dead. Here, deliverance appears to rise above all else. All else. God has delivered us. He is still de delivering us, and he will continue to deliver us. That's what Paul says in that passage there. He says, God is going to deliver us. He is going to continue to deliver us. So, no wonder... No wonder Paul could write in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. Let me read that again, and notice this fourth verse. He says, Blessed be the God of all comfort, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Why does he do that? So that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That means the things you go through, the things I go through, somewhere down the line we're going to meet someone that may be going through similar circumstances. And the word here says, we will be able to comfort them and tell them how God helped us through our situation. We'll be able to comfort them with the same comfort with, that God showed unto us. So what was the result of David's confidence in God? Well, God gave David guidance and victory. David, David encouraged himself in the Lord and he went to God for guidance. He said, Lord, should I go after him or not? God said, go after him, and you're going you're gonna to get everything back. So God, God gave David guidance, and he gave him victory. Fear was removed. Strength was renewed. Confidence was inspired. The re result was that the enemy was completely defeated, and everything that had been lost was recovered just as God had promised. Hallelujah, what a promise that was. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, God told David, Thou shalt without, without fail, notice that, without fail, recover all. 
And then in verse 18, we, do, we read, And David recovered all, plus all the spoil of the enemy. And I think that gives uh, trustworthiness to Paul's words in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think, unto this wonderful God we give praise. So David found the secret to victory. He encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. You notice the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. It wasn't some other God. It was his God. It was the Lord God Almighty. Notice that the Bible says God was David's God. David had found out that God was more than equal for any situation. There was nothing that was too hard for God. David wrote, Many of the Psalms, some were written in good times, some were written in bad times, some were written when he was up, some were written when he was down, some were written when he was keeping the sheep, some were written when he was fleeing from Saul. And David went through a variety of experiences. And as you read through the Psalms, uh, you find out, you hear David referring to God in many different, different ways. Uh, re depending on what kind of situation he was going through. Here are some of the words I picked out that uh, David uses to refer to God. God was his rock. God was his fortress. God was his deliverer. God was his strength. God was his shepherd. God was his light. God was his salvation. God was his hiding place. God was his refuge. God was his helper, his shield, his defense. His glory, his hope, and his king. God was his God. Hallelujah. And God gave him victory in his time of need. So have you ever had experience like David? Disaster before you, danger behind you, and uncertainty ahead of you. Have you ever felt trapped like Israel may have felt when the Red Sea was in front of them and Pharaoh's army was behind them and the mountains were around them. Or the widow of Zarephath, later in Elijah's day, she was down to the very last bit of food she had in her pantry. She was going to fix it, she said, and then die. Or the desperate father in Mark chapter 9, who, who, who brought his son to Jesus' disciples there at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration, and uh, they could not heal him. And when Jesus came down and he, he talked to the father, he asked him, do you believe? He said, I believe. Please help my unbelief. I wonder often how many of us have maybe prayed that, that prayer. Lord, you say that if I ask, you'll give. Lord, I believe. Please help my unbelief. Have you ever been so perplexed and discouraged that you didn't know what to do or which way to turn. Well, I've got good news for you. David's God is also your God. All those things that God was to David, he will be to you. David is your, God is your deliverer, your strength, your salvation, your refuge, your helper, your defense, your hope. Pick any one of those names I just read off uh, a moment ago. And whatever your situation, he might be that to you. Listen to David's words in Psalm 27, 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, when those are closest to him forsake me, he says, then the Lord will take me up. And listen to Habakkuk. Some have called this one of the greatest affirmations of faith that you'll find in the Bible. In the last verses of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Listen to what Habakkuk says. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall there be fruit in the vine. The labor of the olive will fail. The fields will not yield any meat. The flock will be cut off from the fold. There will be no herd in the stall. Yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. A lady in my church one time said, everything may fall apart, but God is still God. And there's nothing too hard for God. You 
may feel like you do not don't have anyone on earth you can turn to, but you can encourage yourself in the Lord. Go to Him for your help, and He will meet your need. Shall we pray? Father, we, this is a, a wonderful thought. David encouraged himself in you. He had no other way to turn. There was only smoke and destruction ahead of him. His men were talking about stoning him. And Lord, he, the only thing he could do was look up to you. And Lord, you helped him. You brought the deliverance that they needed. They didn't lose one of their family. They didn't lose, they didn't lose anything. In fact, they came back with more than they had to start with. And that's just the way you work, Lord. That's just the way you're all. Oh, pray that you'll make this message real to those that are listening, Lord. No matter, no matter what they're going through, no matter what kind of fears they may have, the opposite of fear is faith. And help us to just look to you in faith, Lord. If you're not saved, look to God in faith for your salvation. If you need deliverance in some way, look to God in faith. Lift, lift your eyes to him. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And let God meet your need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for The Chapel Hour with Rev. Russell Weishart and the Weishart Family Singers. For previous programs, please go to YouTube and search for The Weishart Family Singers Channel. If you're a minister, teacher, or student of the Bible and would like to access Rev. Weishart's messages, outlines, and sermon notes, please go to thechapelhour.blogspot.com. And of course, one of the best ways to stay in touch with us is on the Weishart Family Singers Facebook page. We want to thank everyone for finding us, for your encouragement, for subscribing to our channel, and for hitting that little like button. We look forward to seeing you next week on The Chapel Hour.